Hello and welcome to the Investing on the Go podcast brought to you by Funds Calibre. I'm Ryan Lightfoot-Brown and today we're speaking to Steve Andrews, the Elite Rated Manager of the M&G Episode Income Fund. Steve, thank you very much for your time today. Hi Ryan, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, now, first of all, your fund is quite unique in its use of behavioural finance in the investment process. Can you just talk us through that a little bit, please? Yeah, sure. The 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 behavioural finance aspect it's really it's really a behavioural psychology observation that it's an acknowledgement that the market is made up of a bunch of human beings making decisions essentially, and so, so we're looking at price behaviour and correlations. So what moves with and against each other on any given day, week, or month? And we're looking at those things in the context of the facts. So how have the facts changed alongside those changes in price, changes in correlation? And importantly, how does the market describe itself in a sense? So how are, how are people explaining their shifting beliefs and justification around why they see prices going up or down or here or there. And we just try and then knit together what we then hope is a a consistent observation of why is the market doing this or that? So how can we best understand volatility, essentially? So that's mainly the the kind of psychological aspect as it applies to market price behavior. And then, of course, we can't get away from the fact that we too are humans. So we're we're not machines. We can't make decisions like machines. It's simply impossible for us humans to do that. So uh, more and more uh, scientific research explains to us all that our decisions always start and finish in an emotional Base. So essentially, you can't disentangle the emotional from the rational, from the logical in that way. So we need to acknowledge those things in ourselves. So we need to have a system whereby we are vigilant about our own behavioral biases. Because, of course, unless we, unless we acknowledge those things, we can't really get to the, to the heart of what's driving our own investment decision. And this, for me, is where a team is very important. Because if we were all sitting on our own as investment managers trying to make these decisions, we can convince ourselves of all manner of things in terms of how how much we know about this or about that. Whereas if we have a team of individuals that can really challenge us and say, well, you know what, that's not consistent with how you usually look at things. And we think you're allowing your fear to dominate your decision. So it's really in that sense that, that behavioral psychology really is interwoven throughout our entire observation about how the market works. Um, and in that, you said there's, um, the market's justifying, well, you are justifying the market ups and downs as part of this um, behavioral psychology approach. Um, has this part of the process been magnified during the pandemic anyway, where we've seen these huge ups and downs? Um, you said recently that there is ample evidence that human desire is to compare current events with those of the past. What exactly do, I mean, do you mean by this, especially in context of what's recently happened? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this this current phase and the phase we've been going through over recent months, really, in many ways, is a is a kind of classic classic behavioural episode in that sense. And, and and yes, of course, it's mixed with with lots and lots of real stuff. Uh, when 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 we're thinking about the, the the our desire as humans to kind of explain things, it's it it's how we operate as 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 uh, as human beings in terms of our our gathering of information, our brains taking in information on a day-by-day basis from the time we're born until the time we're kind of upright and doing all of our all of our active things in the world. And each time that information comes in, the brain looks around for something that's kind of similar to it in its in its memory and its programming and responds in a similar fashion with similar emotional emotions firing through you. So your 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 seeking of a rationale for these things really does tend to follow a template. It's a useful um, a kind of uh, evolutionary toolkit. It's a useful part of our evolutionary toolkit in terms of adapting to our environment and learning how to respond to threats and opportunities and those sorts of things. But it also needs to be uh, something we're very mindful of in terms of when we when we see something that looks like something we may have experienced in the past, like rapid price falls accompanied by very alarming headlines about recession and the historic nature of that. So the unprecedented nature of many of the uh, the kind of the, the 
that the, the depths explored by much of the economic data, our, our brains really do go into kind of recession playbook mode. And I, and I guess we just need to, my, my comments on that in the past have simply just been to, to try and frame that in a way that says, well, not every recession is the same. And this one in particular, whereby the characterization of the recession as being this tremendously uh, challenging and enduring um, event that then economies will and societies will take a very long time to get over. Well, that might be the case, and it might not be the case. We simply don't know. And I think we need to acknowledge while we're amid the chaos. Yeah, perhaps with that in mind, I mean, stock markets seem to be incredibly confident at the moment. Um, perhaps today um, is a small exception, but the economic data is clearly incredibly weak. We're going to have a huge recession, um, and yet stock markets are touching all-time highs again in some parts of the world. Do yeah. you think this is a human behavior issue, or do you think it is, as you said, the pulling out the playbook of what's happened in the last 10 years with central banks' behavior? Well, it, it's it, it, you're right. I mean, it feels weird, and it feels weird because um, if you had... You, you pop back 12 months, and then you, 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 you rush back from the future. You bump into Marty Mo fly or whoever, and you, he's got the book of what happens in 2020. And he, and he misses out the whole virus thing, but he tells you unemployment rates are all in double digits. He tells you that growth is at minus 10, minus 15%. And then he asks you to guess where the equity market is. There's no way would you be talking about it being new highs. You would be utterly terrified. So that tells us a couple of things in the first instance. It tells us that the market is taking a view here. The market's taking a perspective on that. It's looking at those miserable numbers and truly, truly shocking numbers and concluding something that um, is different about those things. So I do think there is a greater degree of circumspection. I would say that the journey that we've undertaken since March and April, we initially had the, the panic and the fear and everyone was very uh, despairing about things. And then there was the the kind of the noisy um, contest to, to forecast stuff. And now we seem to be, and, and so prices revived for lots of things, not for everything. I mean, the market's been quite discerning in as much as those entities where you could draw a line that said, you know what, not only are these companies and sectors unaffected negatively by what's going on, but they are potential winners in terms of what's going on, in terms of the structure. So it's kind of the, for the shorthand, tech versus old stuff, basically. So if, if you were relying upon the regular face-to-face -face contact with your, with your client, with the person who you're selling your product or services to, then you're in bother. So that in, 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 a, in a very kind of rough and ready sense. But if you're someone who can conduct business uh, globally online and, and would benefit from more people uh, working remotely or whatever it might be, then your earnings will suddenly be worth or your, your, um, the valuation uh, consideration is suddenly worth a great deal more. So there has been that disparity over the market now being uh, more selective over who the market des des describes as the winner's and the losers. So you still have many, many areas that are down kind of 10 or 20% year to date. But then, as you say, you've got lots of areas that have not only recaptured their year to date numbers, but now are showing some positive numbers. And I would say that there has been something of a restoration of, of a, a balanced aspect to things. So the market now see, feels to me like being in a place where the news about the virus and about the economics, so what happens when economies reopen, both to the virus numbers and to the economic demand numbers, the market feels like it's in a, in a position of, well, let's just wait and see how that pans out, rather than conducting um, some expedition into optimism, or indeed, uh, a kind of a, a, a period that says, you know what, we're still very fearful. Because the, the market certainly does not look very fearful, but neither does it look terribly optimistic. And it certainly feels to me like we're not in a position where the market's overstretching and over-optimistic, but neither are we are we super fearful, which sounds really quite, quite boring now, actually. It sounds like you shouldn't really have 
very many aggressive positions on. And I would say that you, sh- you probably shouldn't have very many aggressive positions on. And as an asset allocator, you want to be well diversified and be across the board. So you want to hold some bonds, you want to hold some equities. And within that, you probably want some diversification as well. Yeah, well, that sort of neatly brings us on to um, our next question and your portfolio. You are quite well known for going against the herds um, and going against consensus and assumptions. Um, so but looking at your portfolio, you've got 16% in US equities, which had been leading the rally, one of those markets that are nearing all-time highs that we spoke about. And then just um, a small amount in corporate bonds, but quite a large amount in government bonds. Um, yeah. Can you talk us through these um, in respect to your portfolio? Absolutely. And we and we've changed we've changed that portfolio over the course of the past few months as well. So if just to put some of that into context, because it's been a really a kind of super challenging time, as all as, as as all our clients will know and as all investors will know, it's been a super challenging time this the first uh, six months of this year. In January, when you're looking at aggregate equity valuations, that they, they weren't super appealing. Um, and so within, it was more of a job of looking within markets. So it's about looking at specific sectors. Now, the euro area banks sector stood out to us as being one where we might be able to find um, at, at that time uh, at some really decent quality banks with some solidly uh, financed balance sheets. And certainly we were able to find those. And that was an absolutely uh, kind of constructive thing to do for the portfolio over the course of the past 18 months or so. But coming into this particular phase, that was really challenging because we had roughly 10% of the portfolio in euro area banks, handily offset a substantial holding in US 30. So US 30 year uh, government bonds, which we had up at about 15 or 16% at the time. So that, that in terms of effective portfolio diversification, those US treasuries worked quite well to diversifiers. Um, coming out of or going through the middle of the, 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 the crisis then in terms of the deepest part of the markets, uh, the markets panic, we took some opportunities to diversify the equity. So to broaden away from European banks, we added back into some of those US equities that we'd allowed to fall away over the prior 12 months or so. So back into some of the financial names, broadened out more into Japan, where we've now got 12%. And now we've just got 5% in euro area banks and 10% in the overall euro area. So the breadth of our equity has changed over the course of the past three months. Our fixed income, you're right, we've, we, we've got a good bulk in government bonds, I think it's, it's, it's kind of three-way split in a way, dominated by US Treasuries. So US Treasuries is currently at uh, 17%. Then you've got emerging market sovereign bonds performing a very, very different role. They're at 16% in the portfolio. And that's dominated those that there are four main holdings in there, Brazil, Colombia, South Africa, and Mexico. They're there more as a, a kind of strategic contributor to the income side of the portfolio and to a value side of the portfolio in terms of how the compression of that global bond yield. So the the journey that global bond yields have been on pretty much over the past 15 years has been one that starts in the top left and finishes in the bottom right. And that's been a journey where the market and ourselves have been steadily learning what the value of sovereign bonds truly is. So if we wind forward to where we are today, where central banks are telling us that these rates aren't going to change for some time, despite the fact that, yes, economies look like they're getting back to something closer to, still far away at the moment, but closer to normal activities. So it'll still take some time, but the appetite to be doing anything with those rates is very close to zero. So when we look at our our choices of safety asset. Because when we're asset allocating, as I said before, diversification is key. So we want to have a diversified equity portfolio, and we want to have an overall diversified portfolio from a risk perspective and from a volatility perspective to the extent that we can do that. So if equities suffer another setback, we want something that's going to provide some good diversification. Now, US treasuries are currently offering a yield of 1.5%. That's a very, very positive uh, yield curve slope. So you take one and a half percent and you take away the current Fed funds rate, which is 
to zero, that gives you a pretty hefty premium on that short rate. And that's something that isn't seen in any other uh, developed government bond market. So we're still very comfortable owning a large amount of US 30-year debt. So I think it's, it's important for the, for the diversification point. Okay, so a couple of things from that. Um, I mean, you are the episode income fund, and income is mm-hmm. one of the big functions of your portfolio. Um, yes. We've seen, and you said about the equity setback that we're having in, in equity markets at the moment, and whether with all the dividend cuts, for example, whether we're going to have um, a threat of those that income not being there anymore. You've got a large weight, large weight in government bonds, which are, um, well, protective on a capital side don't help you much mm-hmm. on the income side. So what are you doing for the income in the portfolio? Are your sort of emerging market bonds going to be um, enough to generate the income for your investors? No, nope, definitely not. It's a really good, really good question because it's that's the it's a key challenge that lots of income investors have had um, over the past three, four months. Because of course, as you've seen uh, uh, companies cutting their dividends or skipping them for the time being, or but for many different reasons. I guess the benefit for episode income is that it's not, it's never really been that 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 traditional. It's we've never followed a traditional income strategy. It's always been about the sustainability of income growth, and by that I mean it's just the acknowledgement that the capital well-being and the income are integral. So our objective is to grow the income over time, and that remains our objective. Of course, there will be uh, hiccups along the road. It's helped to be smoothed in the sense of we we have a twelve month distribution schedule, so we we distribute monthly. Um, and we, that means that we can, there's an element to which we can, we, we store up some income and then we overpay or we, and then we underpay or overpay given what we need to do in, in order to manage that income throughout the fiscal year. So it, it, it really does depend what happens throughout the entire span of that fiscal year, how the unit holder then experiences the, any income shortfall overall. So it helps from that perspective, just in terms of the, the the product distinctions, but also in terms of the breadth of our exposures. As you said, some of the EM bonds, there are really varying yields, actually. So we've got uh, yields in the EM space at three and a half and then at 10%. So there's there's a variety. So they they at 16% of the portfolio, yeah, they contribute a reasonable amount. But equally, the uh, egg on the equity side, some of the U.S. banks also contribute quite substantially to dividends. Some of the Japanese holdings have begun in recent years to participate more in terms of dividend payouts. So for us, it really it still has been a matter of, of portfolio positioning first, and then construction to deliver the dividend second. So it, 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 it's I'm, I'm not going to. It's it's not easy in terms of where you get income from. That's for sure. And you just have to make sure that you're doing the best you can in terms of looking everywhere. And part of that, part of doing that, actually, and one thing we haven't touched on yet um, is, is credit, and that we haven't held much credit over the years in the portfolio. Equities have done the job in that way in terms of the, the nature of the risk from an asset allocation perspective. Credit is something that we're getting increasingly uh curious about looking more closely at some holdings we added a bit in us high yield uh about a month or so ago when they when obviously the markets were in were, were still in a phase of distress um that's done okay that's that it, but it's very it's very short term but i think there is there is scope for us to find further sources of that in- income on the fixed income side of the book still okay and perhaps let's go on to your investors which we've touched on um as sort of a final question, have you got any behavioral finance tips for them? We've talked about how you use it in the portfolio, perhaps how they can um, use it in their portfolio and fund selection. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I mean, it's it's always it, it, it's it's funny that one of the one of the reasons I feel comfortable with this approach, and one of the reasons that that, that attracts me to this approach is it's is is its simplicity, but then it can. It can sound overly simple. So essentially, when, but but much of life is like that. Much of life, you need to you need to take take a step back. And I guess thing number one uh, would be remember how little we all really know. And and that's so important when we are when we turn the radio on uh, or the TV uh, and Robert Peston or Laura Koonsberg or whoever else is saying to us in in quite alarming 
tones um, that we're in this or that state, that the historical, that, that you know, you go back in history and you you have not encountered anything as bad, but the size of the government debt when you come out of these, uh, this, this period is going to be uh, this or that, and that has inevitable consequences for tax, and it has inevitable consequences for future economic growth. Just to, to kind of take a pause and say, well, Nobody knows. Nobody knows what's going on in the future. All we can do is take a dispassionate or as dispassionate a look as we can about the facts as they appear to us today before we go rushing to judgment on any of it. So that would be, and then a development of that, of course, is what I said earlier, which is so as investors, when the market is certain about those things. So when the market is uh, sure about stuff, be very wary. It's, it's a version of the Buffett uh, fear and greed quote. It, it, and it's essentially, it's hard to generate a return being more sure or certain than the market when the market is sure or certain about, about whatever it is. But it's a lot easier to generate a return being the wary party or vice versa. So it's, it's, it's having that perspective that says, look, if I don't know what's going on, another, another topic on this front is um, politics at large, but Brexit in particular, in terms of the the certainty that the market expresses about about uh, about Brexit outcomes and those sorts of things, when that would appear to be driving price, you know that's an opportunity because no one can truly know the answer. The market might be right, but if it's priced to be right, you're not going to benefit from that by standing on by standing on the more extreme side. And the second aspect would be uh, would be that there is always, and it's it's behavioural as much as anything. It's just less obviously so. There's always a need for diversification. Always, otherwise you're going. You, otherwise you're being arrogant. Otherwise you're saying you need to be right, and and that's a that's a that is an innately risky place to be positioning yourself. So if there's no diversification available, just hold less risk. It's as simple as that. So there's always some form of diversification available. That's doing nothing. And so if you if you don't like the look of the, the things that will diversify you that are safe, then don't buy them just because they're not what you fear. Hold less of what you fear. Well, Steve, that's been um, unbelievably useful. Thank you very much. And also a uh, very interesting podcast. So thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Cheers, Ryan. It's a pleasure. Um, and if you'd like more information on the Elite Rated M&G Episode Income Fund, please visit thefundcaliber.com. And don't forget to subscribe to the Investing on the Go podcast to get more content from us and our Elite Rated Fund Managers. Please note that these are unprecedented times and the market can react very quickly to news. The views expressed are at the time of recording and could change. And remember, we've been discussing individual stocks to bring investing to life for you. It is not a recommendation to buy or sell. The fund may or may not still hold these stocks at the time of listening. <laughs>